As you may remember, at the end of the last lecture, we were talking about the ending of Gogol's masterpiece, Shinyel uh, in Russian, The Overcoat in English, a story that's recognized internationally as one of the true masterpieces, not only of Gogol, but of the very, uh, of the very genre of the novella, or the uh, long short story, or the short novel. As you may remember, Akaki Akakievich, the central character in the story, having gotten a new overcoat and having gone to an evening party, is going across the square. The guard of the square, of course, is a long way off and can't see what's happening. And all of a sudden, he sees a person with a hand as big as a, as a bureaucrat's head or as big as a cabbage, uh, grabs the coat right off his back. And, of course, the poor fellow is left shivering on the square, doesn't know what to do, comes, comes home in a high fever, and is in a very difficult position because now he's lost that new overcoat on which he squandered all of his money. He has to go back to the uh, rag that he was wearing before that doesn't give any protection against the terrible cold of St. Petersburg in the winter. He doesn't know what to do. Uh, he's given the advice to see a very important personage, a man who's high in the bureaucracy and who might help him. And Gogol takes some time to describe this personage. He's basically not entirely a nasty fellow, but he's had to work his way up in the bureaucracy. And in order to hold on to his position, he takes the motto of strictness, strictness, and yet more strictness. And he likes to intimidate everybody who's in front of him. In front of him. Although, of course, when, when he goes to his own boss, he's as intimidated by that boss as the people are intimidated by him. In any case, poor old Akaki comes in to see the man who's talking to an old friend. Uh, he doesn't like to be interrupted anyway. He looks at Akaki, and Akaki is shivering. He doesn't know what to say. He doesn't know how to, how to put his request in any kind of a bureaucratic form. And finally, he says a, a phrase that's repeated over and over again, and again has become a kind of a proverb in Russian. He says, My dear sir, uh, Is it possible you don't know before whom you speak? How do you dare to interrupt? me like this. And poor old Akaki, of course, is so taken back, he doesn't know what to say. He shivers, and he leaves in total disgrace. Uh, goes home, uh, again contracts a terrible fever, and dies in agony. The important personage, as Gogol said before, or as I quoted before from Gogol, uh, is not really all that bad a person. And thinking over it, he begins to have a sort of a, a conscience. Uh, he, his conscience is beginning to bother him. He even tries to visit Akaki at his place to perhaps make amends, but of course he learns that the man has died. And then there are rumors going around Petersburg, there seem to be some ghosts uh, haunting that particular square, and for that matter, other squares in Russia, and grabbing the overcoats off people's backs. As a matter of fact, says Gogol, once the police even caught the ghost and were about to arrest him when one of them took snuff for his, uh, for his frostbitten nose and they sneezed so violently that the ghost disappeared and they were not able to arrest him. Uh, and so the, the important personage is going through that square, uh, worrying about this, his conscience is bothering him, and suddenly he feels a hand on his back and his coat is grabbed off his back. He looks around and he thinks he sees the face of Akaki Akakievich. And for some reason, he, he is so upset that he even uh, avoids going to, to visit his uh, regular concubine, Karolina Ivanovna. He rushes home uh, to the comforts of his family. And for some reason or other, after that, the ghosts seem to disappear. There are no more ghosts in Petersburg. The story was taken, uh, was taken up very powerfully in Gogol's time. It was extremely popular. And of course, there were many, many arguments about the interpretation of the story. Of course, the most immediate interpretation, the most immediate meaning that you gather of the story, it's a terrible protest against the poverty, against the people who had to live in poverty in Russia at that time. Uh, you remember the scene from the early part of the story where they, they mock uh, Akaki Akakievich in the office, and suddenly he looks at them, and somehow his look stops the mockery, and he says, why are you bothering me? Why are you insulting me? What have I done to you? And to the person who stands next to him, it's as if he had said, why are you doing this? I am your brother. Shouldn't you treat me as your brother? Later on, of course, in the story, uh, when we see Akakia dying and we see the terrible vengeance the ghost takes on the important personage, again, it seems very clear that Gogol is protesting the terrible poverty that uh, the lower classes have to live in, had to live in in Russia. And of course, that was the largest part of the population. But that doesn't seem to be the whole story. It also seems to, impl it seems to be a kind of a ghost story a story that uh, implies some kind of spiritual vengeance that's taken upon people uh, for wrongdoing. 
the devil seems to appear in the story, in the character of Petrovich, the tailor, who when he makes that coat which is tempting Akaki Akakievich, he smooths the uh, folds of the coat, and as his hand goes over that coat, you realize he's making something uh, supernatural out of that coat, as if the devil were in him, as if the devil were somehow uh, pushing things uh, in the direction of this story. Then, of course, as many modern critics insist, this is nothing but the terribly rich and productive fantasy of Gogol making itself felt in the writing. He's enjoying the fact that he can make all of these things come to life in many different directions and in many different ways. It seems to me that these interpretations are not necessarily mutually exclusive. But as a matter of fact, if you look at the story, you find elements of all of these things in the story, and that's, of course, one of the things that makes it so rich and so enticing, makes it live uh, far beyond its own time. So that I would be inclined to argue with anyone who said the story is pushed in only one direction. It's certainly not only a story of social protest, but if you try to eliminate social protest, you eliminate a large part of the story. It's not only a story about a ghost, it's not only a story about a devil, but rather all of these things. And as I said before, that's what makes the richness of this masterpiece. Uh, shortly afterward, Gogol left Russia for Western Europe, where he spent uh, a good part of the next 11 years. And writing from Italy, uh, he wrote a long novel, which is probably the most famous thing that he wrote. Uh, it's called Dead Souls. And as a matter of fact, he calls it a poema, that is a poem. Although, as a matter of fact, the whole thing is written in prose. But clearly, if you look at Gogol's language, there's a tremendously strong poetic element in the language. It's rich with sound, it's rich with rhythm, it's rich with imagery in a way that you normally see in poetry. In a certain sense, it's kind of an ironic answer to Pushkin, who had called Eugene Onegin a novel in verse. Of course, you don't normally write novels in verse, but he was trying to tell a story that was akin to a novel, and yet, of course, he did it in a standard kind of verse. Clearly, these two works, that is, Gogol intended for his work to be a kind of ironic contrast to what Pushkin had done. And as you probably know, the title of the book is Dead Souls, or in Russian, Mjortlya Dushy. As a matter of fact, many, many people, when they see that title, you say, oh, those, those mordant Russians, they're always so sad, not realizing, of course, that the book is to a very great extent a comedy. The word soul, or dusha in Russian, has several meanings. Uh, obviously, it, it refers to the spiritual qualities that we normally talk about when we use the word soul, but it was also used to mean uh, another word for serfs. That is, slaves whom land and landowners owned at that time, you said, well, he has a hundred souls. What they meant was that particular person has a hundred serfs. That would be a fairly well-off person, although there were, there were families in Russia that had many, many more serfs than that. So the title is a kind of a paradox. As we all know, the soul is immortal. That is, if, if, uh, if you think of Russia as a Christian country at that time, uh, the soul is immortal, it can't die, and yet he's talking about dead souls. This got Gogol into trouble with the censors, by the way, at that time, because they said, look, you can't talk about dead souls, the soul doesn't die. He had even to think about uh, another title for it, an alternative title that he thought was Mr. Chichikov's Journey. Mr. Chichikov is the major character in the novel, and, of course, he is, uh, he's something of a swindler. He's a, he's a charming guy in many ways, but he's also a terrible swindler. And uh, you, we, this has to be explained, of course. The, the, the way the system was set up in Russia in those days, souls, that is to say peasants, were entered on the census rolls. And the registration of the census was taken for 10 years. Every 10 years there would be new a new registration. When someone died, when a serf died, uh, his name was left on those rules until the very next revision. And of course, if he died early in that 10-year period, it would, that name would be there for perhaps as, as long as nine or nine and a half years. And of course, as long as it was on there, the, uh, the landowner was forced to pay taxes on that particular serf. Now, Chichikov, our Mr. Chichikov, something of a swindler, uh, got the idea that he could buy these serfs as if they were alive, but of course they were, they were actually dead. He would buy these dead souls from the uh, uh, landowners. He would then have them on his role, uh, he being the owner of a certain number of serfs, and he would accumulate a, quite a large number of serfs, dead of course, but nobody would know that except himself and uh, those, to, those who sold it to him. And then he could go to the government and get quite a large loan uh, using the serfs that he presumably had as collateral for this loan. And in that way, uh, he would hope uh, either to swindle the government out of a considerable amount of money, or perhaps set up an estate for himself uh, where he, get the pro he could get the profits to pay back the loan to the government. 
so that uh, Chichikov uh, is a kind of a petty, or perhaps not so petty, swindler who has come to this uh, provincial Russian town to buy dead souls from the uh, landowners who are at the town. Of course, when the landowners heard the scheme, they were uh, quite surprised. They uh, didn't know what to do. And so Gogol has Mr. Chichikov, first of all, meet the people in the town. And of course, uh, when he meets them, he makes a very uh, sweet impression on them. Chichikov can be a very sweet fellow when he wants to be. And once he's, he's established himself as a personage who visits this town, then he goes to visit people in the countryside. Gogol has a wonderful habit in the course of telling stories, particularly in this, he uh, repeatedly creates fantastic characters like phantoms out of a wizard's vat. They flash before the reader's eye and then simply disappear without ever being seen again. And of course, you get a whole series of these half phantoms, half people coming before your eyes. The novel seems to breed people, almost as if there was some way of creating people at a particular time. When Chichikov is bargaining to establish a price for a dead soul with a man named Sabakevich, literally means son of a dog, or one might uh, use an even uh, cruder expression in English, Sobakevich waxes eloquent about uh, the serfs that he's talking about. Milushkin, the bricklayer, could set up a stove in anyone's house. Kiliatikov, the shoemaker, no sooner sticks his all and you have a pair of boots, that's a pair of real boots, and not one drop of liquor in his mouth, very unusual for a Russian peasant. And Yerimye Sorokaplyokhin, the guy can compete with the best of them in Moscow, but says, Chichikov, wait a minute, we're talking about people. They're not good for anything. He says, yeah, they may not be good for anything, but you want to buy them. To which, of course, uh, Chichikov has no answer. Now, in dealing with his dead souls, Gogol also creates a series of characters, a series of landowners whom he visits, and they become unforgettable figures in the Russian literary tradition as well as in Russian everyday life. When Chichikov talks, uh, it sometimes sounds like honey is dripping right out of his mouth. When the local worthies first meet him, they react in a very, very nice way. The governor says he's a well-intentioned man. The prosecutor says, well, he's a practical man. The colonel of the gendarmes says, well, he's a learned man. The chairman of the chambers, he's a knowing and honorable man. The chief of police says, well, he's an honorable and likable man. The wife of the chief of police, he's an extremely likable and tactful man. And even Sabakevich, who seldom had a good word for anyone, was taken by his charm. Of course, Sabakevich's uh, wife replies by kicking him. Chichikov is so delighted by the way that they uh, greet him that he jumps up joyfully and kicks himself in the backside. That gives you a taste of Gorgon's style, of the way he deals with, uh, uh, with uh, the characters. The first landowner whom he visits is a man named Manilov. Now, Manilov is one of those guys who, when you first meet him, you think, oh, he's a wonderful guy. There couldn't be anything sweeter. But you talk with him for a minute or two, and then says Gogol, uh, you want to say, may the devil take you. Because no matter what you say, he reacts with some kind of a sweet reaction. He never tells you anything of what he really thinks, anything of what he really feels. Gogol says, every person has some kind of characteristic which characterizes him. Every person has a passion. In Russian, everyone has his own passion. You say, well, the next minute you would say nothing, and the third you would exclaim, the devil, what kind of a man is this? You'd move away from him, and if you didn't, you'd be overwhelmed by a deadly spleen. Each man has his passion. One concentrates on barzoi dogs. Another believes he's a great lover of music and is wonderfully sensitive to its most profound passages. The third is a past master in revelry. A fourth in playing a role one inch above his measure. A fifth more bonded in his desire uh, sleeps and dreams in order to show off in the company of an imperial aide-de-camp to his friends, acquaintances, and even strangers. A sixth has a sleight of hand and is imbued with a supernatural desire to turn down the corner of an ace of diamonds or two, while the hand of the seventh itches to establish order somewhere to insinuate itself near the face of a station master or a coachman. In short, everyone has a peculiar quality of his own. But Manilov, huh, nothing at all. У всякого есть свой задор, но у Манилова ничего не было. He spoke little when at home and for the most part reflected and pondered, but what he was thinking about, God only knows.